Okay, we'll call the Public Works and Planning Committee to order. And I'm going to ask Mr. Commissioner Stevens if you would mind saying a prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of this day. We're thankful for the rain that you've provided for us. Father, we pray for those that are in the storm's way and that you'll keep everyone safe and minimize any property damage. Lord, be with us tonight as we make decisions for our county. I pray you'll give us wisdom and that we'll make decisions that are based on your word. Father, I pray that in all things that, we'll, that we do will be like your son. We pray this through Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Approve the minutes for the last meeting. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Jump right there and do the highway commission right quick here. You got your uh, chief there before you. We got uh, uh, drainage easements, deer crossing subdivision lots 24 and 26, two easements. And you got uh, easement there on Stewart Creek Road. Tax map 25, parcel 26.01. Stewart's Bend subdivision lot B, got easement. Long Creek subdivision lots eight and nine. Need a motion to approve the roads. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, landfill report. Good evening, how are you? Good, how are you? Fine. With rain, it's kind of slowed things down just a little bit. We went from being hot and dry to wet and muddy. <laughs> other than that, everything at the landfill is running pretty well. And then uh, on the convenience center side, the uh, loads are up just a little bit from last month. And they're up about the same amount from last month as they were last month last year. So the economy's turning just a little bit. Uh, recycle hauls are still running a little over 20% of what we haul. And then the single stream program is running pretty well with the schools. We've dumped almost 80 tons of recycling material from the schools since they opened up, which is less than five weeks ago. And uh, Commissioner Black always likes good news. <laughs> we, got a, money, no. <laughs> <laughs> we got our last new roll off truck this week. It should hit, or last week, and it should be on the street tomorrow. It's going to be all of our trucks that we've ordered and purchased and been delivered. Anybody got any questions on uh, landfill or convenience centers? I've got a question, Mac. I was reading this actually this afternoon. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't misreading it. Was there, is there changes coming from the state in regards to tire disposal or anything to do with tires? Mm -hmm. Does that ring a bell at all? Yes. Because I don't yeah. know if anyone else on the committee had read that, and I, I didn't know anything about it in detail. Could you just... Help me understand it a little bit. What's, um, what's changing? What they do. In the past, you had two ways. We take in the tires. Mm -hmm. We have a contract with the state. We have the tire grant, um, and we take the piece of paper that says you brought in so many tires and you're tired, and then we send it to the state to get reimbursed. Um, we get seventy dollars a ton reimbursement. If we reported your tires by the ton, you would run out of tire money before you would if we reported it by the tire. Mm -hmm. So now the state is doing everything by the tire, but we still get rid of it by the ton. So it'll never match up that way. It's just an easier accounting thing for them is, is by the tire. So, so that's really all it is, is an accounting benefit for the state then? Right. Okay. And I didn't uh, know it, if there was anything behind that. It should help the tire dealers a little bit as far as whether the state has averaged a car tire Back when we were younger, most cars had 14, 15 inch tires. Mm -hmm. Now most of them have 17 and 18 inch tires, which they weigh more. So a tire is not necessarily a tire in those two terms. So right. the, the more weight they are, if you charge it by the weight, then you get paid by the ton that way. So this is just stuff that you had, you had discussed before then, right? That, and that was the only thing that's really changing on the state we, level. I saw it, and I, didn't, I just didn't know if there was anything else that I might have missed. We were doing it by the tire anyway, okay. and how we'd been reporting it. Uh, the, the big difference is it's a dollar a tire across the board. So if 
Commissioner Black brings in four big tractor tires, it's supposed to be a dollar, and it cost us a whole lot more than a dollar to get right. rid of them. County Commission approved last year for us to charge $65 right. a ton. We just break even. So we have that to where we, we don't lose money, we just don't make it. Okay. Thank you. Did uh, not our sign here where y'all was going to get this strip paved in front of it? Did y'all get that? Yes, sir. We got that completed a couple weeks ago. The paving company that we were dealing with, of course, got a little bit behind. It took longer than we hoped for, but they did a really good job. Anybody got any other questions for the director? September the 17th is a Saturday from 9 to 12 is a oil-based paint collection at City of Marshboro on Florence Road at their public works facility, and it's oil-based only. So if you bring your latex paint with you, we're going to send you back home with it. Uh, there's no, that's a uh, T-Deck thing. They pay for the disposal and all that kind of stuff. We just do the collection. But T-Deck's not collected all base or uh, latex paint, paint anymore at all. There's not really much of a way to get rid of that other than to dry it yourself. And once it's in its dry form, you can throw it away with your regular garbage. And then on November the 5th is the Household Harrison's Waste Collection. That's for your chemicals and pesticides, those type of things. Uh, neither event will take electronics and that type of stuff. We do electronics twice a week already. Anybody got any other questions? If not, we'll take a motion to approve his report. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Does that mean I'm first next month? Mine in the park. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, on your tables, uh, prior to the meeting, I passed out our uh, monthly reports for the recorded class with available lots uh, from January 2004 through August 2011. Uh, you'll see on the second uh, full page, uh, the front of the second page, you'll see uh, we had, uh, though it's been uh, a few months since uh, we've been here, you'll see that there have been 25 recorded lots, newly recorded lots, uh, mostly in the Ridgeview at Crescent Ridge subdivision. And total available lots is 1,481, and compared to July, this, these are both July numbers, July, July of last year, it, it is down uh, about 40 or so, maybe 50 or so lots. Not, not, uh, not a large difference, but it is closing just a, just a little bit. So you'll see that. Also, as uh, we try to do quarterly, uh, we've also included uh, on your desk, the, or the table rather, the subdivision lot inventory by school zone. Of course, we have it broken up by high school, middle school, and elementary school. Just to kind of give you an idea of how many recorded lots, well, how many lots total really not recorded, recorded, and even a few expired flats in there that may come back at some point in the future. We have those in there too, just to give you an idea of how many lots are there by school zone. So if you have any questions about any of those, I'll be more than happy to entertain those. Will you wait till Stewart's Creek is open before you add them to this report? Probably, yes ma'am. We'll have to see what the actual zone is, I suppose. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, at this point, I don't know what they do. If there's no other questions on that, oh, I'm sorry. No, sir. Uh, on these lots and houses, I mean, estimated as far as the kids going to the school. We're right, talking about this list, sir. Right. Well, okay. you can go to buy a household. What is it? Is it one or 2.5? Well, if you're household? using, yeah, yeah as a as general figure, you can use two and a half people per household. Now, if you look at census numbers, it's probably not quite that high. And I know a few years back, the, uh, the, our OIT department did uh, some sort of study on that, which gave a, a some sort of a, a percentage, like point. I forget what the exact number was. Right. Uh, how many students per household? When we did that, the mm -hmm. study was like point seven. Point mm -hmm. seven per household. Mm -hmm. Okay. Per household, you have so many households that have none. You see, so on the average, I think that's what it was. It was less than one. Right. Well, exactly. that that's still pretty concern, high concerning for Riverdale because that's fourteen hundred seventy one lots. Mm -hmm. And something that I know yeah. that uh, we, we talked about too uh, when we first did this was this is just county lots. Right. Uh, you know, the yeah. cities 
don't necessarily break it up the way we do. Uh, you know, I know Murfreesboro, they have a list similar to this, but they do it by city zone mm -hmm. as opposed to county. So or really, so. black men and all the other ones are probably a lot higher. They're, they will have, they'll have more than what this indicates, yes, ma'am. Hmm. I appreciate this. It gives a general idea of what's happening to each one of them as far as the school. Well, glad that you're all finding it useful. I know we, I know we do, and we. Uh, provide this to the school board as well when we update it in the quarterly is usually how we do it. Mm -hmm. I know they keep up with a lot of things too, but uh, you know I know this is helpful to them as well. So. Should put out on that. Yeah, well, I'll go ahead and if there's no other questions on that, I'll go ahead and move into our zoning report. Uh, as, uh, you know we haven't had just a whole lot of zoning applications this year. But we do have uh, one zoning application and an ordinance amendment uh, for your consideration this month. The zoning request is for a piece of property located on Couchville Pike. Uh, the actual address for the property excuse me, is uh, 8909 Couchville Pike. This is a piece of property we've actually seen several times in the past. Uh, most recently, we've seen it back in 2008. Uh, they received a conditional use permit for office space and parking of construction vehicles. Uh, also back in 2005, it was processed for a, uh, a, a distribution of pre-weighted goods for curing of rubber. And then back in 2003, the building it was originally finished to commercial standards. So it, this, it, the building's been there actually since the 1980s, but it became a commercial structure about 2003. We've seen a few applications on it over time. Uh, each application that was received until this recommendation she had before you was just for conditional use permit. The property is still at this point zoned residential. The proposed use uh, that's coming before you this month is for the building to be used for an electrical contractor's office. Uh, the name of the business is Impulse Electrical Systems. They design and install electrical equipment for commercial and industrial clients in the area, including Nissan. Uh, most of their work is done on site. Uh, they typically employ about seven employees working from the office, uh, normal operating hours. Uh, again, this property has been used commercially for a number of years now. It was staff's recommendation even back in 2008 when this came back up for the last conditional use to rezone the property as well as the conditional use. Uh, at the time, back in 2008, the recommendation was just again for the conditional use to leave it residentially zoned. However, this time the Planning Commission uh, first staff's recommendation is recommending that this property be rezoned. The big reason for that that we made at the Planning Commission was that, you know, this property, there is really no residential use for this property and it probably won't be any time in the future. So at this point we just feel that, you know, it looks like a rose, it smells like a rose, let's just go ahead and call it a rose. So go ahead and give it the commercial zoning, plus that will give us the leeway for any improvements to be done on site to be done in accordance with the zoning resolution mm -hmm. as far as parking, screening, uh, you know, those kind of things. So the uh, Planning Commission did recommend in favor of that request to zone the property commercial or services, which is a commercial zone, as well as to have the conditional use permit for this uh, electrical um, contracting office. The second request, again, is an ordinance amendment uh, to our, uh, well, uh, our, to our zoning resolution in regards to storm shelter uh, applications. Oh, too far. You have a copy of the proposed regulation in your packet. Uh, but because of the recent outbreak that we've had of severe storms in this area over the last few years, both our staff, planning and engineering, and also our building codes department have seen more and more requests for storm shelters, you know, either in the house or uh, maybe as free, you know, outside of the house, kind of underground shelters. Uh, while we want to encourage these kind of developments, the zoning is really silent on these kind of structures. So we decided to try to come up with some, some guidelines, well, not guidelines, but regulations to uh, regulate these uh, installation of these systems. This really deals more with the standalone out in the yard, you know, underground kind of uh, situations, not so much someone who reinforces a room in their house or something like that. That'd really fall more into the codes. But we did some research uh, about it. We actually contacted our uh, the National Planning uh, Association, that National APA, and they sent us some, some guidelines from some areas around. We've also looked at uh, a few uh, ordinances in Tennessee and how they do it. And we, we, again, we didn't want to come up with something that was so burdensome that people wouldn't want to do it. But at the same time, we did want to have something on the book so that people came in, we'd be able to treat everybody the same when they came in. So essentially, you know, uh, we would define storm shelter as any structure built above or below ground with the sole intent to protect life and limb from adverse weather conditions, and we would have uh, just uh, four different restrictions. 
uh, the shelters themselves could not be constructed in any utility drainage or public right of way or any easement like that. Uh, storm shelters would have to meet our bulk regulations as far as setbacks and those things are concerned, but uh, would not, uh, we would not count them as far as uh, actual square footage for detached accessory structures. Uh, you'll, you'll know that depending on the size of a lot, you're allowed to have a certain amount of detached space like garages, carports, whatnot. Uh, right now, we don't count pools, and we would not count these either. So they would uh, be kind of free in that sense. Um, if it's an above-ground shelter and is burned with fill material, the burn slope would be no greater than three to one. It would not extend onto any kind of a public right-of-way. And uh, there was a lot of discussion about this at the Planning Commission, but the fourth um, criteria, uh, and we shared this with uh, Mr. Jones uh, to get his input as well, but the construction shall comply with the latest edition of the International Code Council uh, ICC 500 storm shelter standards and would require normal building permits and inspections. So those are the standards that uh, we felt were, again, that gives us guidance as to what we're looking for, but we didn't feel that these were going over the top. You know, we saw, depending on where you were looking, you know, especially out in the Midwest where, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, you know, some of them get pretty in depth as what they require. But uh, we wanted something that would still allow, you know, encourage people to construct these. But I, we didn't feel it would be over, overly burdensome. Uh, I know Mr. Jones is present. At least I think yeah, he's still present. Uh, he can go into a little more detail about the, self, the standards themselves as far as the ICC 500 go. But, uh, you know, he read this over and we've talked about it. And the Planning Commission has debated it uh, over a couple meetings. And, and we feel pretty comfortable with this. So uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I've got any questions, though. Was there, it's the international IC, did you say ICC or ICE? Is that the preferred guidelines that other individuals use as opposed to one that's? I don't know if you do. Uh, yes, sir. Um, it's, it's basically the, the standard for the nation. Um, national Storm Shelter Association Mr. Keisling uh, is the executive director of the National Storm Shelter Association, and the last few years he's been working with ICC to come up with a, um, a, a code to go by. Mm -hmm. uh, International Code Council met, and they produced this uh, 2008 version of the ICC 500 to inspect the performance of storm shelters. Um, the International Code um, does cover the structural stability and how uh, the wind speeds connect with the type of materials that's, that's being used in the structure. So um, with the National Storm Shelter Association and ICC, they've come up with this document that um, can be used across the nation, can be adopted and uh, used for that type of uh, certification on the storm shelters. Uh, as Doug mentioned, it's not to say that if you want to strengthen a room in your basement and just, you know, say that's your place to go, uh, it may not be certified, it may not be able to be inspected directly by ICC 500, mm -hmm. but it's your safe place. So, but, but the ones that would like to go all the way and be certified with a storm shelter for protection or is paying somebody for a certified storm shelter, right. we can go by the code and inspect those materials and those connections to, to make sure they meet the minimum standards yeah. for those storm shelters. Um, the testing is done at uh, Texas Tech and uh, the standards are set by FEMA. So FEMA does have some storm shelter guidelines, but they are mainly the performance end of it. This code is actually a code in hand that you can go out and inspect with. And uh, we have been going by the FEMA guidelines for oh, almost 15 years now. They have some blueprints and things like that that we could give the public. but. Um, there is so much uh, storm concern now that we've had these recent storms. Um, this is a way to protect the individuals that test their products in the proper way 
and are certified by the National Storm Shelter mm -hmm. Association and can have that stamp approval. And uh, then we can have the ICC to go by to, to uh, do these inspections and, and make sure that they're correct, correctly stamped. People are getting what they paid for. Yeah, and, I, and that's, I think, what a, a little bit of my concern was. I just, as Doug said, I just want to make sure we're not pricing people out of trying to be safe yeah, for their and, families and, because of those regulations. Are they, whatever FEMA says or whatever the ICC says, is that going to cost somebody several thousand dollars more because they're saying we're going to make our guidelines based on an F5 in Nebraska as opposed to some sort of storm we might see in Tennessee and not that any of those are any greater than the others, but I just didn't know how they were, mm -hmm. what their minimum requirements were based on this is a bad enough storm when we set these guidelines in place. So I just want to make sure we weren't, mm -hmm. you know, pricing people out of trying to be safe if they wanted to be safe at their own property. I, I think we can use it more as a protection tool for companies that are charging mm -hmm. and call it this is a safe room, but yet it wouldn't meet minimum standards. Right. So I think we can use it more for that kind of tool. Uh, more so than just uh, forcing somebody to go by a guideline. Okay. And it, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The uh, the planning commission I think had a similar concern uh, about that. You know, a lot of discussion was uh, at, uh, was was had at the planning commission regarding somebody just wants to put up a, a structure. Right. Uh, where they go, you know, I think the word man cave was used right. a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. came up a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> but it wasn't built to. You know, they may use it for a shelter, right. but it wasn't built to those standards. Right. Our basic our response would be, well, you can still go ahead and build that. You just won't be considered a storm shelter right. under these regulations. You know, if that's where you go when there's a storm, you know, yeah, that's that's all up to you. But you know, by these regulations, it would just be an accessory structure. Okay. It wouldn't be considered a storm shelter okay. at that point. That's good. Thank you. I'm sure emergency management, they got involved in discussions on this as far as every one of them that's issued permits for them. If it is a tornado, I'm, I don't know if public safety, I might be overstepping my boundaries, but as a emergency responder, um, well, I know we've talked about it up at work, having documented where they're at. Mm -hmm. If a tornado comes through and there's nothing there yeah. left, you know, we're going to have to have some kind and of... I know that's what T mm -hmm. Tuscaloosa, Alabama has been going right. through. You know, it was just uh, um, devastated to where, you know, you didn't know what street you was on or what. Absolutely. So, so to know the locations that people may be trapped in right. may come in handy for rescue. Right. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know whether... So we could, uh, and get them you involved. know, start... Um, if we do issue a permit for a Pacific Storm Shelter, absolutely uh, document that. I think the citizens would, after explaining that point to them, mm -hmm. I think it would uh, be a whole, go over a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Doug, if we if we maintained a list like that, like who would you share that with, so that? I'm just because I make I'm thinking because like, when the disaster yeah. happens, it's too late for somebody to go digging around looking right. for the file. You know, we need to be sharing that probably preemptively. Our, right. So probably our emergency management uh, department, our uh, just whatever our jurisdiction they're in. Sheriff's office, or? E911. We could yeah. probably even get it into our GIS system. Oh, so, yeah, just pull up yeah. the map that shows so, all this. Yeah. Certified storm shelters. Yeah, and anyone that could put it up on GIS okay. uh, during that, and then we use that GIS system a lot during yeah. these storms for addressing and and um, uh, street and everything breath, you know, right. to locate and and to locate the path and so. So you might want to go ahead and consider adopting a policy. How you're going to implement that? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good information, old Jack. Bringing it, mm -hmm. you and Ron are both about that. Well, I didn't, I didn't want to step on the public side. No. I'm sure they'll be questioning that. I just thought I'd bring it to them. Well, yeah. I think when That's it comes good. to public safety, it's not overstepping mm -hmm. bounds at all. I, I hate to, mm -hmm. I just hate to go above. No, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody get, else got any questions to you, you gentlemen? Uh, no approved Doug's Doug. just planning. Okay, we need to approve planning. I make a motion we approve the report as presented. Second. Anybody else got any questions on? All in favor? Aye. 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 If I could just make this one uh, just 
a quick announcement. Uh, the uh, the first draft of the zoning ordinance, new zoning ordinance, has been completed and has been distributed to the planning commission and members of the uh, steering committee, the uh, comprehensive plan steering committee, not the not the county commission. And uh, we do have extra copies if any of you are interested at the office, or you can I've obtain it on our website. You can actually download it on our website. We have the link there uh, to it. Uh, we had a brief presentation about it uh, at our last planning commission meeting and are going to be having a work session at the September 26th meeting, uh, right well, following the September 26th, uh, September 26th meeting uh, this coming, uh, be about two and a half weeks from today. So that meeting will be at 9 a.m. We'll have our regular planning commission and then we'll have the work session afterward. Our consultant team is going to be there to discuss more in depth. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's only about that thick, you know, when you spread it out. <laughs> light reading. Just light reading, right. So if, uh, and if you have, after looking over, you have any questions, let us know. We'll be more than happy to talk to you about it. Uh, we're currently now working on zoning map. That's, uh, that, that'll be a, a pretty uh, big task, but we're getting through it, and uh, that'll be the next step. So I just want to let you all know that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David, you ready to jump in? Yes, sir. Um, tonight's report's on your table for August building permit activity. We issued 167 permits. Uh, monies taken in was $100 for plan review, $35,088 for permit fees, $3,800 for plumbing permits, <coughs> 565 for gas permits for a total of $39,553. On the back is our running totals for the year. We've issued on the right hand column totals, we've issued 223 single family dwellings this year. Last year, uh, first eight months was 244, so we're about 21 houses behind on our totals for the year. Um, our total permits, 1,272. Our August, 29 single families this August compared to last August, uh, we're a couple of houses ahead of uh, the monthly report on that one. The next report is uh, our zoning enforcement inspections. Our totals are in red. 641 total inspections performed for property maintenance, 93 total inspections for signs in BZA cases, and we had 99 new uh, cases set up in August, and we closed 277. These are really big numbers for us. Uh, what what? happened in the last few months uh, it kind of built up on us and built up on us to where we had some people out we had some people that had some medical procedures whatever so I had to regroup everybody and I mean everybody I've been doing zoning inspections and uh, uh, we we uh, kind of got together and we sent the building inspectors out every day on, on some type of zoning enforcement and uh, our zoning enforcement officers that we've got left too so uh, we, we did close those 277 cases, so we were really, really glad to do that. And um, it looks like we're kind of on the downswing of the grass now that we've had the rain. I don't know, we, it, it, but, but we have cut a lot of lots lately, and, and hopefully everybody will get caught up on their properties where we won't have to uh, uh, do a whole lot more after September. I have a question on that, Dave. Mm -hmm. I, I know we've talked about one where, you, you know, they cut the grass and then a few weeks later, grass is up again. So does that count as two cases when it's a repeat violation or is it still the same case and not it, closed? It's or? basically the same case. Uh, in, the, in the one that you're talking about, we, before the time was up on, uh, the total time was up, they did cut the property. Right. And then they still had some violations on open storage of vehicles and trash. Uh, and then the grass was too tall again. Right. So I had to get back on that. So with the, uh, with this So that just remains open? Yes. Okay. But with this particular case, uh, it's going to remain open until we get the complete 
all the violations cleared up. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I was just the curious. Open storage and everything, yeah. and we're still working on that. Um, this particular case has had a very hardships. Yeah. Yes, hardship cases in, in first one thing or another, and yeah. and I do think they're working on it. So right. hopefully we can stay on. I was that just one. curious how you counted, like if when somebody falls back into that cycle again. I wasn't sure if they yeah if as it's, long if it's still counted as one or if they count as two every time they they're in violation. I wasn't sure if you were. Um, if it's called back in. Okay. And it has been closed. Okay. Then it's a new case again. Okay. Because so some but of these, some of these closed, are repeats. You're seeing exactly. Some of okay. them may be eight months old to a year old, okay. and, and it's still just an open case. Okay. But then some may close and then be right. called back the next month okay. again. So uh, that would be a new case again. Okay. But uh, but that one one case will remain open until finished. On the next report that I have is a development tax collection. The building codes department took in seventy-eight thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, planning department for lots took in three thousand dollars for a total of eighty-one thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. Our cumulative total uh, since July one hundred ninety-four thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. And that's my report, Mr. Chairman. Anybody else got anything you want to ask David? Anybody any reports, anything else? If not, then I'll take a motion to approve his report. That's so move. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank y'all. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody on the committee got in hungry when we bring up? Not on move with journey. Last year we were at 235.